because now I'm actually a police officer. I do uh, special victims. Um, so I didn't go back to work for about six months. Oh, so you like law and order SVU out here. You like. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's what people say. Yeah. Dun, dun. So that's, that's good. Yeah, that's pretty much what I do. That's what's up, man. That's, I mean, how's that? Like, that's, I mean, that's probably, you probably see some shit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it, I will say, man, you really, like, people, uh, I can the whole speak about law enforcement. I think it needs to be redone from head to toe. Of course. But from the special victim side, I'll say there's some people that really need help. Um, they do things where I, you'll sit with them and be like, you need, you have a mental illness. It's just, you see a lot of darkness in people. There's a lot of people, like, when, my, when it comes to my daughter and wife, my wife will tell you, I am like, OCD with her and not because I'm trying to be overbearing it's because I know what's out here and yeah. it's it's scary man it's scary what's up fam I want to say thank you for checking out my podcast also if you have a book or you're an author and you want to use podcast interviews to generate more book sales go ahead and go to wealthydelivery.com go check out my book two books one podcast Pretty much just breaks down everything you need step by step to use podcast interviews to create more book sales. I mean, it breaks down everything from what you need as far as equipment, um, how to contact your guests, uh, what to do to prepare for the interview, and most importantly, how to conduct the interview. So go ahead and check it out, www.wealthydelivery.com. Also, it'll be a link below. But uh, yeah, enjoy the show. Holla at you later. Peace. All right, Grayson, what's the tip of the day? Why in school didn't they teach us to just write a book? Tell them to bring me my money. Yeah! What is up, folks? Welcome back to another episode of the Wealthy Delivery Podcast. And today I got one of my best friends from the past, man. Dude I haven't talked to in forever, but I'm happy to catch up with him today. My boy, Mr. X, Xavier Cochran, man. How you doing, bro? I'm doing good, man. It's definitely good to see you, man. It's been a minute. It's been it's been a good minute, man. But uh, mm-hmm. I'm definitely excited to chat with you, man. Um, how long has it been, really? Like we really think about it. Like when's the last time we probably saw each other? Probably twelve years ago. Oh. Like early twenties. Early twenties. I saw you once. So I probably said it's been a good good decade. Let's say that good decade. Damn, that's a long ass time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but. Minute. Yeah, but still, even with all the time that's passed, man, I still consider you like one of my favorite people, man. Like when we I had a lot of good times, a lot of lot of jokes, man, a lot of jokes, a lot of jokes, dog. Uh, yeah, man. So it's like I think about what. So we know each other since middle school, pretty much. It was like seventh yeah. grade. Mm-hmm. That's a it's a different time period, man. This is this is it's so crazy. Um, a lot of hoop sessions. <laughs> a lot of me shitting on you and <laughs> right. I was telling somebody I said dude man I was talking to Bruno I said you know he's a buster I tell a lot and he I was like who I was like Devon he's like man no he did no he didn't and he's like yeah he did he did he did he did, he did. I was like, he used to be awful oh man you guys were no you it was funny man because that you guys because you played in college didn't you very very briefly well, still, I mean, that's something, though. Like, you definitely, for your, I want to say you you had the skill. <laughs> you, you had the skill. You just weren't, like, af- I don't even want to say you weren't athletic. You're an athlete. But it's just, you were just a. Short. <laughs> I don't know. You you understood the game. You And the thing is, like, looking back on it, I've seen the progress of you, like, you getting better as time went on. Bruno was nice, too. Um, he plays overseas now. Yeah, that's yeah. See, so I mean, I'll still give him buckets though. But yeah, I agree on <laughs> that. But no, man, it just. But it was like, yeah, it was. I did used to bust your ass back in the day, man. But <laughs> it was all fun, and we had some good times, man. Um, I think as much as I loved basketball too back then, man. Like I, I just didn't love it the same as I got older. I loved it in a different way, like. I still love it. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I, but I realized I loved it much more as a spectator versus like as much as I love playing it. I loved it like ten times more 
as a spectator. And I was just talking to my mom uh, the other, or not too long ago, and I was just saying, even my brother too, I was like, you know, as black kids, like basketball. Everything. Yeah. It's like, but that, I felt like it wasn't delivered to me in the way I could have got the most from it. Like, we we only got to look at it as a player. Like, you know what I mean? Like, but if somebody brought it to my attention of like, like workout coaches or like agents or like even owners, like, you know, Mark Cuban's my dude. Like, I look up to Mark Cuban, you know, obviously Mavs fan still to the day I die. So, but it's like, if those kind of like, aspects of the game were brought to me or brought to light and I feel like it was such a push for like oh you gotta play you gotta play you don't play in college you don't do it and it's like man but there's so many other ways you can be a part of the game without actually playing it mm -hmm. and I feel like I would have kind of thwarted myself into that a little bit more but at, after after a while it just kind of became like a chore like and that's I can see that yeah it's like that kind of I started to like by senior year man I just like experienced like some major burnout of basketball like and they're like even my coaches like yo you it's having me going like you know some college visits nothing like d1 i wasn't like no stud like that but you were a d1 talent though you were a d1 talent i didn't i i will say but i didn't have the because some people went d1 that we went went to school with did go d1 and you were way better than them i ain't gonna say their name but there's a couple people that did go d1 <laughs> I don't know, man. I appreciate that, man. I tried not to put too my own horn. I really don't think I was that that good. I was. I thought I was decent. Uh, I can get you a bucket if you need one. But, <laughs> like I said, I can name a few people that you'll go, damn, you're right. That they go D1. <laughs> yeah, well, I appreciate that, man. That, and I take that I, I take that high praise from you because also one of my favorite things about you, I feel like you're, when it came to sports, your opinion was very unbiased. Like, I, I hate, I can't have basketball conversations with a lot of people these days because, like, there's just so much bias in it. And I'm like, nobody, like, you've always been one of those dudes, like, I could sit down and talk about basketball with from just, like, a, the correct kind of lens, you know what I mean? So, I can see that. you saying that is a big, a big, uh, a big compliment. <laughs> but... Yeah, man. I, I think if somebody was like, yo, you know, you can be like an agent or like you can <laughs> you can do this or like I probably would have gravitated that a little bit more. But like because even now, like I'm a I'm a homebody. I don't like to I would I would have hated traveling. I would have hated all the interviews like people all in my business. What did I eat today? We use with this person. You're supposed to be with that person. Like <laughs> all the stuff that comes with it. So I really don't like attention in that kind of way. But yeah, as far as just like getting out and hooping. Um, just for the love of it, that's that's never going to go away. I'm still playing uh, hoop leagues and stuff here in Columbus. Uh, well, COVID shut that down a little bit, but I'm still like, after I get off this interview, I'm about to go jump rope, and um, you know, I got to stay in shape because if I, when I, I do play, I still want to dominate. You know, what I mean, I'm not right. I'm, I'm not. I may not be that guy. You, I, I don't know. Sometimes I think I am a little bit better than <laughs> mentally. I am like I'm just I'm much more efficient in know what I can do, but I've been playing with the same dudes in our hoop leagues for like, I don't know, probably since like college. Um, so hopefully they bring it back. Everything slows down with like the COVID situation, but I'm trying to be in like in shape when that time comes around because I'm trying to bust some ass. So pause. That just made me think about Ian too, because I wanted to tell you know, I was looking at one of his videos and I say, I wanted to tell Ian, Ian, you play better at 30 than you did when he's at Shawnee State. You play better. Like he plays at a more controlled speed. It's not, Ian. you know, Ian, he just wanted to go. Yeah. Now he just kind of does his move, shoots a shot. He, it's more smooth. Yeah. You under, I think that just comes with like maturity. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it's, Ian was always a hooper too. Mm -hmm. I, I remember, I remember, because he what was at, eighth grade so he would have been seven like he came he didn't make the team uh i think it came down to like him and cameron and mm -hmm. they were like going they were like battling out for that like last spot but he ended up being like the team manager and then he you know played that next year but i mean he always was a bucket i mean i remember just times at the y good times at the y too man i forgot <laughs> we used to have we had some battles there um uh, so hoop man, it just was in our blood, man. It was, it was it's never gonna go away. But 
Um, yeah, man, cause great times. There was, there was some hoopers back then. A lot of hoopers, man. Uh, mm-hmm. War Park, man. I'm, we had some good times at War Park too. I miss War Park. <laughs> that was some glory years, man. There's so many, so many memories. They can make that honestly into like a Netflix TV show and make some serious money. It sounds corny as hell, but all the stories and all the people getting in trouble, like that was legit. Crazy personalities we had back then. Seriously. From Miles to Sean to there's so many different people we had back then. It would be entertaining. Yeah. I remember you broke your finger. Do you that was that? that was uh that was ninth grade actually. That was was it okay? That was yeah, because I missed like half the season. Um it was my thumb. I broke my thumb. Cause I remember yeah. you grabbed something and you looked at me and you was like, I said, holy hell, like dude, your finger. You looked down and I was like, oh damn, I gotta go. And it was like bent all the way back, if I remember. Yeah, it was like I I'll tell you what happened. Like I like touched the ground or something. I don't even know why. Like I just like went down, touched the ground. I don't know if I was trying to keep my balance or something. And my thumb was just kind of like I had to have surgery, I had to have a pin put in it. And I missed like uh yeah, half a season for a freshman year because of that. So I remember that. <laughs> yeah, that happened in gym class, man. That was uh Gym, I love gym class. Gym class was fun. Mm-hmm. If I could, if I could go back to school and just have gym every day, that's what I would do. Like, that's a lot of our friends back then. That's all they did was enjoy gym class <laughs> until now. So, I've, I maybe I should have been a gym teacher. I don't know. Who knows? I maybe. can see that though. I actually had, I uh, before I like started doing like this, like my, you know, getting into entrepreneurship and having a podcast and things like that. I was a sleep technician, so I ran like sleep studies on people with sleep apnea. And uh, Miss Evans came in for a sleep study once, and I had her. Oh wow! Yeah, she, I don't think she remembered me too much, but you know, she probably sees a lot of students. But and I don't. I mean, I guess I kind of look the same, but I got facial hair a little bit here and there. But you know, it's. But nah, yeah. So that was just like it was. That was a crazy blast from the past. I was like, so I had to be like maybe like two or three years ago that happened. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, man. So what's up with you? You've been you you're married, got a kid, man. It's married. What well, I've been married for what, six, seven years. My wife's a nurse. Got a daughter. Joined the Navy. Moved to North Carolina. So that's where um, you are now, huh? That's where you are now. Yeah, I'm in North Carolina. Okay. Which part? I th- I think I've been lived here since 2011. So I've been here for a minute. Okay. Um. Joined the Navy Reserves, went to Japan for a couple months. That was amazing. Life-changing experience. Um, broke, ruptured my Achilles out there, so I had to come home. Um, How'd you do it? What'd you do it? So it was crazy. Funny talking about basketball. I was trying to relive the past, <laughs> and I was playing against this dude, and I scored, and I thought I was cool, so I tried to do it again, and all of a sudden, it just went out. Like, I mean, I just collapsed to the ground. And... Um, didn't have the surgery, but I was—I couldn't go back to work in the states for about five months. I couldn't go back to work. Jeez. Because um, now I'm actually a police officer. I do uh, special victims, um, so I didn't go back to work for about six months. Oh, so you like law and order SVU out here? You like? <laughs> <laughs> right, that's what people say. Yeah. Dun, dun. So that's that's good. Yeah, that's pretty much what I do. That's what's up, man. That's I mean. How's that? Like that's I mean that's probably you probably see some shit. Like <laughs> <laughs> it, I will say, man, you really like people I, I can go whole spiel about law enforcement. I think it needs to be redone from head to toe. Of course. But from the special victim side, I'll say there's some people that really need help. Um they do things where I, you'll sit with them, you be like you need you have a mental illness it's just you see a lot of darkness in people there's a lot of like when, my, when it comes to my daughter and wife my wife would tell you i am like ocd with her and not because i'm trying to be overbearing it's because i know what's out here and yeah. it's it's scary man it's scary no I, I i feel that and like i said even you being that close to it i'm sure it's even like amplified like 10 times but like even just as i look in the world and just my perception of things and just seeing them like, yo, with the kid now, like it's a game changer. It's like, yo, I've got to prepare this person for the world. Like, you know, I got a little black son. It's like, yo, 
yeah, everybody loves this little cute black boy right now, but this someday this little kid is gonna be a big ass man and y'all gonna fear this dude just for that. And so it's just like, which even pushed me to like what I'm doing now, man. And how like, you know, how I spend my time, how I wanted to make my money, like everything. It, I, 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 a big f- f- uh, switch had flipped in me. I wanna say, it was before he was born actually. Uh, I read the book Rich Dad Poor Dad. I, mm-hmm. I read I read The Richest Man in Babylon, and I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, and that just like completely changed the way I looked at like money, how I made it, how I used my time, and then soon I was becoming a dad, and so I was like, I want to ingrain this kind of stuff in his head early because this is stuff that should have been taught to us a long, long time ago. Um, so that's when I like I got into writing books and you know whatnot and uh yeah man it's just like did you see how what the world is going to throw and like i don't want to sugarcoat him from anything like you know and, and, he just, and he's just a smart kid like kids are smart like i feel like our kids are way smarter than us naturally than we were at their age you know they're just not as experienced and mm-hmm. you know but as far as his natural raw intelligence you know these kids are like little geniuses man so I agree. I just want to make sure I'm putting the right things in his hand and the right thing in his head, creating the right habits that I wish people would have brought to me. So that's why I like I really dove deep into like entrepreneurship, having mentors, even things like meditations. Like I meditate like daily, like just little things that we know that works, like, but we just don't do because we don't make it a habit. So yeah, and I'm like, I'm sure you see some stuff in your line of work. It's like, yo, we have to do this because this is, like you said, this is what's out there. This is what the world's going to throw. This is what the world's going to throw at us. So I think that's, man, I think that's huge. Um, but, just, but it's just, yeah, having, I don't know how you do it anyway with a daughter, man. I'm glad I didn't have a daughter because. <laughs> like, I think it has a whole dimension, man. I think like, if I had a little boy, I probably, oh, man, we're going to be good. You know what I mean? But when you have a daughter, you're just like, everything's on a hundred like i just i panic and i just, like literally sometimes i just look at her like man i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to punch somebody in the mouth i feel like i'm just gonna have to because y'all just gonna do something all the way left and i'm not gonna handle it it just it's like i said having a daughter just makes you think about every last bad thing that could happen yeah it's just crazy well yeah she's a beautiful little girl which is crazy to say because she looks just like you so <laughs> <laughs> like i was like oh yeah that's definitely xavier's child um, mm-hmm. nah, man, like, I knew I would have been no good with a daughter, like, because I'm, truth be told, I'm probably a sap, a softy with my son, honestly, mm-hmm. you know, but, like, I got two nieces, my sister, like, actually, two nieces that live here, and I have two nieces from, uh, my other sister, but the ones that live here, they had me wrapped around their finger, like, they were born before Grayson, so they're like, one just turned six, I think the other one will be five, here soon four or five i can't keep track of all of them but <laughs> it's like but i was like i couldn't tell them no you know what i mean like i can't when i'm so if i had a daughter like i know it would have been no good like anything she wanted i feel like mm-hmm. with a boy i can still kind of be a little bit stern but even let's be honest mm-hmm. he still kind of gets what he wants if he really wants it but yeah man it's just so shout out to you man it takes a different kind of dude to have a daughter man <laughs> Uh, yeah mm. um, and it just makes you soft like I'm such an emotional person now which I don't mind like I'm I, I my goal is to show my son who I really am you know what I mean not regardless of who I've been to the rest of the world like there's always a part of yourself that you don't really show to the whole world and then after my son was like I can no longer afford to do that I had to be me 100% all the time and that's leads me to who I am today, man. It's like I have no filter. I have a filter to a degree, but like I don't I have no filter anymore for the daughter. None. <laughs> like I'll be just telling people how I feel, honestly. I just think we have kids, you just you lose that filter, I think. Yeah. You just want them to see everything so they're prepared. Yeah, right. right. Um yeah, man, it's, 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 it changes the game, man. And we're, here we are, man, at age 32 with kids, three-year-olds, grown men. 
it's wild, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I do have a few questions for you. I want to just kind of pick your brain a little bit, man. Uh, do you do you read a lot or anything like that? You you been reading anything? Do I read all? I'm actually I try. Last book I just read was David Godin's book. You can't hurt me. Mm -hmm. um, and also I do this stock market. I started doing that last year. So I'm always trying to read more articles and things like that. Actually, that's what really, really got me into reading a lot more now is that. Um, but I just got done reading David Goggins' book, Can't Hurt Me. Nice. How was that? I like David Goggins. Yeah. I listen to a lot of his stuff. Man, I'm telling you, one book you should read, that book was amazing. Truly amazing book from beginning to end. Like he makes you realize there's no excuse for anything. Yeah. It's a good book. I, uh, the book that made me actually start wanting to read again, I read uh, Relentless by Tim Grover. Okay. Uh, and that's when he's, you know, he's talking about Mike and Kobe. And yeah, he, he talked about Dwayne Wade in there too. Like how they just like their approach to the game and like preparation was just different. And mm -hmm. that really, that really just drove me to like reading again. And then once I started like learning about like financial freedom and stuff like that, I never like, I'm not putting the book down ever again. Because like, and that's my biggest even thing with my son. Like I don't want, I realize the school system is not set up for us to be financially free we're it just there's no other way to put it like they they're setting us up to be the work jobs and it's like mm -hmm. yo a job is not a job can take care of family to a certain degree but you want to be financially free and like you got to create multiple streams of income so that's when i started even writing books so i wrote my first book i was like i'll write a book every year and release it on my son's birthday um so i'm not i probably you might not be able to see him because it's a green screen, but I wrote the first. Oh, you can't see it. Uh, <laughs> an hour. Oh, okay, it goes in and out. But an hour play keeps the nine to five away. It's my first book, and that was when I realized like how much you can get done in an hour, like, and even like just an hour investing in yourself. I'm sure like even like in that David Goggins book, I'm sure he's talking about like time. Like you have time to do the things you really want to do. So that's when I was like, I was working my job and I was like, all right, but I'll spend at least an hour a day building an income stream for myself and learning how to like do marketing or whatever it may be. Um, posting, creating YouTube videos, whatever. So, and it pretty much, I realized I can plan out the perfect day. I, I can design my own life. So I'll write these books for him because at some point I'm not going to be here anymore. Like I mean, if, if thing goes the way they're supposed to go, like he's going to be here, I'm not going to be here. But I want him to have access to all this information and knowledge that I was learning about financial freedoms. And that way he can like, if he ever feels lost or stuck, he can be like, all right, well, my, my dad mentioned this in this book or in this and that book. And then uh, I saw once I read, once I read this, written this, it's a passive stream of income. I was like, oh, I, writ, I wrote this book and I'm waking up to book sales. Like I, I, only did, I only had to write this book one time and it's consistently bringing me revenue. So then I learned, like, I started going back to even, like, school. Like, I was always a good writer. Like, I think I, I got advanced, like, on the OGT. And, like, I always got good grades in writing. But, like, no teacher ever told me to write a book. You know what I mean? Like, they could have told me to write a book in college. And I would have been like, oh, this will pay for college. You know? <laughs> so, but that's, and I'm not blaming the teachers because society is not groomed that way. But I'm definitely going to groom my child that way. Um, so then I wrote my second book, which his for his, his birthday just passed, um, Nepotism for Dinner, which is about building generational wealth using the book. Because I realized if like I did, say I did this for the next 20 years, each year I wrote a book and released on his birthday. And even if I just made one sale of each book every day for the next 20 years, that's like $2 million. Like for like, for yeah, it's a little simple, it's just a book. Like, and it doesn't take very long to write a book. So then once I started like realizing my podcast was helping me create more book sales, I wrote another book, Two Books, One Podcast, which is pretty much how I do podcast interviews to increase my book sales. So now I have three streams of income right here that I don't have to do. And this is something that he can benefit from. So now when he gets older and now he wants to go to that basketball camp, oh, his book fund mm -hmm. money, or he wants to go to, he wants a new toy. Or, but my secret strategy is, as he gets older and really, cause he loves books. And like, I want to keep that alive. So putting him on the cover, see him, see himself on the cover, looking at these books. And when he actually learns how to read, 
I'll be like, and when when he comes to like, all right, hey dad, I need twenty dollars to go do this, or I need forty dollars to go do that. I'm like, well, go read go read chapter two out of this, go read chapter three out of this. And so I'm kind of like just ingraining those ideas and the ideologies in his head. And then I'll just quiz him, like, yo, what do you think? Do you think you can use this information? How would you use it? And like, even now, like I teach, so I'm teaching stuff about like cash flow quadrants and just like putting those words and stuff in his head. So he just knows. So it's like a norm for him. You know what I mean? Instead of just like mm-hmm. waiting until he's like an adult, like, all right, let's teach you about money and get a job. Like that's setting him up for failure. So that's my whole mad scientist scheme behind that. And plus by the time he gets like to do an activity and stuff like that, I don't want to miss anything. Like, I don't want to be like, That's true. oh, dad can't make it to your basketball game because he has to work. Like, fuck that. No, we. I'm invested <laughs> in you, bro. Let's go get these buckets. Oh, you want to go get some jumpers up? Let's go do that. Like, mm-hmm. I just want to be available at all times. And I realize, you know, there's no point in waiting. So um, that's why I left, like, I left the full-time job. And I, like, I started doing this. I do have, like, a little part-time job now, but, like, I refuse to give my more of my time to a company versus I give to my own or what I'm building. And I haven't looked back, man. It's like, fuck that. So, that's that's just smart thinking and blessing right there. I, I commend you. That's hey man, it's it's been it's, it's it is it's been some struggles. It hasn't been all beautiful. Like don't get it. like it's definitely been hard, especially with a kid, like you know what I mean? But mm-hmm. I realize like, you know, no matter what, I can take a I can take I can make a take a twenty five dollar an hour job, go work for twelve hours, you know, and call it a day. Or I can sell a twenty five I can take an hour and sell five twenty five or twelve twenty five dollar books. Like, which is more efficient use of my time? And sure. Like, so, and no matter how long it would take me to figure it out, I was like, this is what I'm going to do. And but like I have like coaches and stuff, and I'm like, you know, access to the right people with just mentoring. And it's just like, you realize it's a process. So it was like, there's never a right, perfect time. There's never enough money to go for it. It's like, you just gotta go for it and just build it. And yeah, man. But I, I gave myself like, yo, when time, by the time he turns five, I want to com- be completely immersed into it. Like full time, nothing else. So I get that's, that's coming quicker than I think, but I, I'm pretty sure I'll be ready. <laughs> I can see that happening. Um, but yeah, man, I definitely would check out that David Goggins book, man. I guess he's, when I wake up and I have my morning routine, man, I turn on like my motivational audio and he's definitely- What's that? Which one is that? Is it like a, where's the audio from? Is it YouTube? I know people got different YouTubes. They um, listen to the motivation. I usually, I mean, I get it anywhere I can for real. Like YouTube, definitely. That's where it started. Um, but sometimes I like listen to like some podcasts or like even like on SoundCloud or Spotify, they have like. Uh, motivational uh, compilations. Uh, there's this one I usually go to. I think it's called like Motivational Hour or something. And he, there's a David Goggins segment on there. But I've just watched some of his interviews and stuff too, as well. Like I, I yeah. nerd out on that stuff, kind of hardcore. So, um, do you do one one question? Do you consider wealth success? If I'm wealthy, do you consider me successful? I think success is. Doing exactly what you want to be doing, like okay. I, I is which is, I, I find it weird that so many people try to define other people's success. You know what I mean? Like even like I'll, I'll use basketball for instance because this is an easy analogy. Like people will take a dude like Westbrook for example, and be like yo, this dude's not a success. He's never been a championship. He's this and that. I'm like, but if this dude is like if Russell Westbrook said, hey, I made it to the NBA, I'm taking care of my family, I'm happy, I got to do what I love, like, that, if he considers that success, that dude's a success. Wealth, on the other hand, I think wealth is just the ability to do what you want, when you want. At least that's how I look at it. Because that's, and that was what I was, that's the whole, my, my business and logo, wealthy delivery. And it's pretty much a mindset. When I started reading these books, I realized for me, it was like I was reading recipe books. You know what I mean? Like the rich dad, like the first thing I learned that upset me, but it upset me at first, but it really changed my mind. was when I read that richest man Babylon and it said, pay yourself first. 
which is like the most simplest thing you can do. Like the easy, like 10%, 10% of your paycheck, you just put directly into a savings account. And like, no, what upset me is like, no one ever taught me that. And I didn't learn that till like age 26. That's great because that's when I got my life together. It's 26, 27. That's crazy you said that. I agree with that. <laughs> and like, and that should be common. Like people will tell you to save, they all save your money, but they don't teach you how to save it. Cause, the, but the thing, the chances are the people that's telling you to save aren't saving themselves. Or at least they don't have a strategic formula to doing it. So I remember I read Rich Man Babylon and I started like 10% of I direct deposit, like opened up a savings account, direct deposit 10% of my paycheck into that savings account. And I just remember like after like two or three months, I'm like, damn, that kind of built up quick. Like, and you're not going to miss that 10%. Like we spend that 10% on bullshit. <laughs> so I realized like people, people try to, they spend first, then try to save what's left versus saving first and living off or, you know, doing what's left. So when I did that, like the idea in my head, like, damn, if I, did, I've, and then in Rich Man Babylon, it's like, you're supposed to take that 10% and use it to create more money. Like, you know, create assets. So I was like, well, I'm kind of, I, I really do like saving this 10%. So let me change the numbers up a little bit. So I started doing 10% into my savings, 20% into like a separate business account or like for investing, for learning, for buying books, for buying courses, anything that I felt that was going to give me money back. Maybe not in like immediate return, but like at least in knowledge, something that a skill I can go learn, bring back. And just like to run my business and like anything I need to pay for online. And then I lived off the 70%. I like, and I'll live, you know, I'll live off the 70% food, housing, whatever. And then my goal was, all right, since the 20% I use to make money, like whether it's like hosting my book on a website or whatever, I reverse engineer the process. So I was like, all right, the money I make from this 20%, I'll put another 10% in my savings. I'll put... 70% back into it and then the 20% into my living expenses. So I increased my living expenses just a tad bit, but like, so that way I can have more money to invest into like learning and growing. Um, so whether it's like be mentorship or whatever. So that was kind of like my strategy and like that way, doing it that way was like, yo, I will never go broke if I live off this system here. I call it like a money web. Like, okay. so... Cause I don't, th I think a job should be used to, a job shouldn't just pay you to live. I think it should be used to, a job should be used to fund your dream or your, whatever you want. And then for, or let's say a business, your job should be used to fund your business. Like, yeah, you need to go make some money real quick to go start up something. But you, I feel like your business should fund your lifestyle. So that's why I think everybody can have like a business or at least some, I don't think everybody should be an entrepreneur, but everybody can have multiple streams of income. That's why I tell everybody, everybody should write a book, man. Like people don't throw away books. People throw away business cards all the time, but people don't throw away books. Mm -hmm. So in, you know, if you had, like I said, a book is just a, a quick, easy passive income. There's no rules to making a book either. Like it could be a fucking 300 pages or it could be 10 pages. Like a book's a book. Like long as it has the valuable information in there, it's whatever. Like this, I think mean, this one's like six, 17 or 18 chapters. This one's only like seven. And this one's like, this is just like a little how to. This is not even, what is like 18 pages maybe at most, but like they all serve a purpose. So, but I'm like, if you have a kid, you definitely should write a book because, you know, kids should always have access to your brain. Like Agreed. Grayson's always gonna have access to my brain no matter what. And I didn't want anybody else telling him my story, you know, especially being black in America, man. Like, you know, they'll fump, they'll twist up a story in a second. So <laughs> um, but like, I don't know, man. Like, I was like, the more books I write, I never know when I'm gonna leave this earth, man. Who knows? I could be the fucking, you know, you know, driving, like you said, with the whole policing system and law enforcement like you know how it is being black and seeing like a cop behind you or you don't know what's you know so even those kind of scary thoughts go in your head 
And you're like, yo, what if I'm killed by a cop, right? For some reason. I still look. I still. People get confused. I still when I get I get pulled over probably more than the average person because I speed really bad. <laughs> I am terrified, and I'm telling you as my profession, I don't play with that at all. Like I am terrified about getting pulled over. Like you would see me if using a car with me, you'd be like let's do breathing hard, just do like yes sir, no sir. Like only difference is honestly, I have a badge. Yeah. Like so that I I be honest, it gets me out of stuff, but. Before I hand out that badge, you would see me like, but um, um, but that would be, that's just how I am. Like that's why I said it doesn't really matter, like bad or not. I I don't play with cops because there is there is people out there that I I'm telling you they, I say my honest opinion, twenty percent are bad. I, I now I'm saying twenty percent are bad. Like you get pulled over, I say. You need to shut the hell up, give me your, your your ID and keep it moving. Literally like that. Yeah. Or you're gonna, you're gonna have a bad moment. And 20% is high. You got things that's, high work. Oh, super high. Right. Super high. high. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's and in the way America's built, they act like they don't understand that. Or they don't want to understand. Or they don't they just don't care. Let's put it that way. So mm-hmm. yeah, man, that's I, that's and but that's like a fear I have. Like if I had to get in my car, like I might I like. I hope I don't see any cops going to wherever destination I have to go to. Like, <laughs> I don't care if the cops in front of me. Like, I'm still nerd. Like, yo, I'm not trying to. And but that was my thing. Like, I was like, um, and people knowing their rights. That's one thing I've realized. I've only been a cop a couple years. Like, so I didn't get my life together. So I was like 26, 27. But I'll say is people. I really I always tell like minorities, black, Hispanic, whatever, know your rights. Because I've talked to so many people they do not know their rights. And that's always the first issue when it comes when they deal with law enforcement. They don't know what the rights are. Mm. That's a, uh, hey man, you might have to, you might have to put on like a little class or something, man. Like, cause. We need that though. We, a, we need those type of situations. That's, that's just how my brain works now. Like, I can't turn this off. Like I'm always looking at what people do and what, what skill sets they have or like knowledge they already have and seeing how I can like deliver it to people because Say you had like a little workshop that you hosted like once a month, just teaching like basic rights, like basic, you know, that's another income you have as like a cop, you know, that's not having to do with, I just, I feel like when people, people believe they don't have a skill set, I'm like, bro, you, you just take what you do at your job and put it in a book or put it or host the class. Like, yo, that's another, that's the income stream right there. Like I, you just go to work and just come home like you wasting that knowledge to a degree, I feel like, and I feel like a most probably ninety seven percent of the world does that, and like they don't mm-hmm. think they have valuable information. I'm like, yo, somebody needs this information. Like, no matter, what, I don't care if you're fucking making pizzas. Like, there's somebody mm-hmm. out there that wants to know, yo, what's the best way to make this pizza? Like, and but that just comes from like a lot of reading and a lot of just studying and looking. I realize too, no matter what business or income stream or like income method the formula was kind of similar no matter what the like the niche or the niche or whatever people call it may be different but the formula to like sell it or get it out to the world is pretty similar so you learn the formula you pretty much can plug in any niche and that's what but school teaches you you know you got nothing yeah, there's nothing. Like it's it's I have I, I hope my son doesn't want to go to college. He's not gonna need to, but I like I hope it was just a social experiment. Like I met a lot of great friends. I appreciate it. And I you know, friends that I'm still friends with to this day, but overall it's like from my bottom line, it was nothing. Honestly, everything I've learned about life is outside of high school, college, every like if, if my daughter said she didn't want to go to college or high school, I know it's my son crazy people. I'd be like, I'm okay with that. I can teach you pretty much everything on the basis. I know we get like certain math and stuff yeah. like that, but the basis of life, you're going to learn that outside of uh, school. You're going to learn it. Yeah. Um. So I, I think, I do think college is pointless. Like when I got that piece of paper, I made less money with it than without it. Like I didn't get any money getting a college degree. I like, it's funny, man, because like so many people flip over that piece of paper, man. Like it's like you know, it's literally just a piece of paper. Like you paid thirty, forty thousand dollars to get this piece of paper 
for for what like you literally especially now like you can pretty much learn anything from either like a mentor going directly to whatever it is you want to learn or just even like youtube like i know and i was a youtube kid back in like high school like I remember before basketball games, I was like, all right, how to tie a tie. Like, I was just always, even though I knew how to do it, like, I would just always pull up the video just to make sure I was doing it right. But, like, that was like, mm -hmm. like, you pretty much can learn anything on YouTube nowadays. Like, if I wanted to de deliver a baby, I probably could go on YouTube, how to deliver a baby at home. Like, there's just so many ways. There's no excuse not to learn what you want to learn. Um, can I ask you a question on that part you just said? Yeah. So, we go, you come from, inner city you come from the true inner city right do you blame what you just said do you blame the, the schooling system or do you blame people who went to school with as far as like going out the and learning going, to find the information yeah well because we, we weren't taught anything from Woolworth park north like, anything important i don't i I think it's, I don't think it's, I think it goes bigger than that, man. I think it's just America in general. I think we're just taught to be followers, not leaders. You know, we're not taught to think for ourselves. We're taught to like follow the rules. And that, that form, that just forms a, of a, just a lack of like going out and just trying to figure shit out. And the thing is, you're going to have to go figure shit out anyway. You know, Green. but they're just not, you know, we're waiting to, your boss is telling you when to have lunch or when to be at work. Your teacher's telling you when you can go to the bathroom, when you could, when you could raise your hand, when you could, it's like, I don't, I just think that's America in itself. Like, I don't really think they push creativity. And that's my main goal is like, I want to keep this kid, his creativity alive. And I'm thankful. I like, I feel like I'm a very creative person, but I've definitely been able to like, boost that and re I think I know how to learn now versus like because I always got good grades but I was just doing like the work they do we do the work in class like you just do it like I'm I don't know how people didn't like do their homework like I would literally have my homework done before we even left class like we just learned it like just do the homework real quick they just went over it you got 10 20 problems max knock that out real quick one I like to do my homework at school because that cut into my basketball time if I didn't do it and my video game time. Like, I'm not trying to be wasting time doing homework. Home is my is my time, not, not school's mm -hmm. time. So I was trying to take as little homework as home as possible. But yeah, I just don't, I don't think they, they don't push you to think on purpose. They don't teach you, actually, in this book, there's five principles I talk about that I think every black family should follow or in one of them is always have a way to generate ideas because everything comes from ideas. And like, so if you know how to like generate ideas, if you know how to sit down and develop an idea, that's what entrepreneurs do. That's what, that's what the Elon Musk do. That's what the Jeff Bezos do. That's what the Mark Cubans do. They, they have a way they can generate ideas and they have a formula to bring that idea to life. So you learn the formula, like I said, you can plug in any idea, just, but the school, the problem with school is they teach, they teach the idea first, and then they try to like, all right, go figure out the formula, how to get this out. Instead of just teaching the formula to get something out and then plug in any idea you want. And that's, I think that's, but they don't, like I said, they don't teach, they don't groom you to lead, they groom you to follow. It just, it's, it's worse for us as black people because of where, you know, just everything else that's on on top of it. So a white kid coming from like the suburbs, not necessarily capitalizing on his idea, but still just can kind of, it just was, America's not built for us. It wasn't built for us. It, and people that I realized school, colleges and stuff still wasn't built for us either. Like that wasn't, I think people confuse knowledge with education. Like knowledge is like active, like education. I can read a book on like building a computer, but I'd rather go to that dude that actually builds computer that never read a book in his life about it, but he's built 20,000 computers. Like that's knowledge. Education is me sitting in front of his classroom. Like, well, I need to plug in this part and not get any hands-on training. And that's what they do with us in school. And I'm like, 
Like I said, I could have wrote a book in like middle school. I want, <clears throat> I followed one formula from probably elementary school all the way through high school that in every, every classroom, every test I took when it came to writing, I got great scores. And it was literally, we learned it in elementary school. They like, how to write a paragraph. It was like, they'll say it's three to five sentences. So they'd be like, you got your opening sentence, you got three supporting sentences, and you got your closing sentences. Or your closing sentence. That was the same formula I followed. So I didn't know like, all right, you need to write five paragraphs. So I'll be like, all right, you got your opening paragraph, you got your supporting paragraphs, and then you got your closing paragraph filled with those support, the opening sentence, that same structure. And I, that's the way I wrote from all the way up until, even till now a little bit. I, I'll change it a little bit because I learned like copywriting and like writing to sell. Um, but it's, it's, it still comes from like the same, it's a very, a lot of similarities there. But like that literally got me to, I had a situation, it was at Northland before I left Northland. 10th grade, I don't know, I forget my 10th grade teacher's writing teacher thing. But we were signing up for like classes for the next year. And I was like, I was just taking the next class up. And she was like, no, she like erased it. And was like, no, you're taking advance. Like, so if she, if she already knew I was an advanced writer, like the OGT score that came back said I was an advanced writer. Why isn't anybody telling me, yo, you can make money writing books? You know what I mean? True. With That's the true. same formula that you use to learn to write. And I, I just, I feel like they use our, they, they're, they're like siphoning through us. They're like looking for which one of us is the most talented, most skillful, so we can go work for a company and the company can capitalize off our skill versus our, us capitalize, capitalizing off our skill ourselves. But yeah, I just have a big beef with the, with the way I have a big beef with America, but especially like the education system, the way it is, it's not, it's not built for us, man. It's awful. I'll use myself. You remember Richard Cooper, right? I'll use him an example because he'd actually be happy about this. Yeah, I remember my son, my, me and him graduated high school with a 1.1 average. Seriously? Seriously. We graduated high school at a 1.1 from uh, inner city school. So statistically, we should probably be dead or in jail literally statistically yeah. he has his master's degree in business um i ended up graduating get my bachelor's two bachelor's degrees from ohio university and um we both make i make on average about 75 plus my military check so my goal well, long term, my goal is at least average like six figure salary so i say what to say is that the school system like you said they pick if you remember, they always pick who they like to move forward, all the smart classes. Right. They didn't look at all the other students, because there are some smart students that we had that were just knuckleheads, but they needed that push, but they weren't picked. And then, and that's even goes and goes back into like, there's, I think every kid, every person has ability to be intelligent or whatever. <laughs> but like, you got kids that are going home to like just, situations that are not ideal or they can't so you and you push them into you gotta now they gotta go to school and concentrate when their home life isn't even that where like you said the mental health issue in black people is alone is just crazy so like but you know how if you took those kids and like put them in the right environment got them meditating got them eating right exercising like they're a whole different person you know what mm -hmm. i mean and that's that's another you know battle within itself but that's the very like I realized when I started reading these like success and wealth books, I realized what they were doing wasn't wasn't rocket science. It was very simple stuff. And where I noticed too, why even another reason why I started writing books, I can go read a book like Rich Dad Poor Dad or The Richest Man in Babylon. But a lot of my friends, a lot of my peers aren't gonna go read that. But they'll take that information from me. So like if I put it in the book or if I teach it, I'm not. I'm not making up these rules or anything like that. I'm just the source of like, yo, I'll tell you exactly where I got the information from. I always tell people, when I tell people about the 10, 20, 70 thing I do, it like blows their mind. Uh, and I remember I had, a, I had a dude at work. This is when I still worked at a sleep tech. I had, I used to, I still have it actually. I keep like a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet of like, or I can plug in the numbers or you can like, you can see where you'll be at in three months if you follow it and this and that. And I showed him this one night at work. And uh, 
before we left that morning, he was just like, he turned around. He was like, thanks for the night, man. And I'm like, and I'm just excited because like, yo, I, everybody needs to know this information. I'm like, man, no thing, man. And then I didn't work with them again for like probably like another two or three months. And then I, you know, next time he's like, dude, you won't believe how much money I saved doing that thing you, you know, showed me. And like, I still get that now, but like people I help, they're like, how is it amazing how many people don't know to pay themselves first? It's like, but I learned this stuff from Richard. I think these books are, they're not purposely geared for like white people, but it's just like, you can't relate to those dudes. Like you see a white dude on the cover or this dude, Robert Kiyosaki on the cover, you're, the typical black dude is not gonna go read that book. It's not appealing. But like, if they see a dude like me talking about it like that, then they can relate a little bit more. But I'm just giving the same information. Like, cause if you read all these wealth and success books, they're all giving the same information. But it's like, mm. it's, it's, it's making it simple for people and making it digestible. So yeah, man, it's like you said, it's, it's, it's just not, this place was not made with us in mind. And, mm -hmm. but I feel like there's a big, oh, uh, there's a huge wave now. I think it's, I don't know, will the people, I, cause here's the thing, the people I follow, I follow a lot of entrepreneurs. I'm in those circles. I'm in like a lot of Facebook groups. So it's like, it's very environmental. So you have to create your environment. Like those people that be like, man, social media is so negative or it's like, that's cause you, one, social media is based off algorithms. So they're showing you exactly what you want to see. So That's true. you like that negative stuff. There's, I tell people to go to your YouTube, just go to your YouTube homepage. What do you see? <laughs> <laughs> like, and it'll tell you exactly who you are. Like, it, it, that's a hard pill for people right. to follow. Like, I literally go to my YouTube right now. But it's crazy. Another book is a good investor. Yeah, I literally like factory reset everything just yesterday. I just had so much. Cause I record my video game content too. That's another stream of income that I use. I use, I do, uh, I use it for affiliate marketing. So, okay. uh, can you see my screen or no? Uh, I see your main screen. I don't see another screen. Let me see. Uh, nah, I just see this, right. the main right. screen. Even like, uh, I don't know, I'll tell you another thing too, man, that changed my, cause I was working nights and I remember I started studying like, you know, just successful people. Like what are their routines? Like what time do they wake up? What do they do when they wake up? And I, you know, I noticed they all wake up early and working nights, that shit is hard to do. But on those days off, I did I start waking up early. I remember I woke up at like four o'clock, had a good night's sleep, woke up at four o'clock and I was able to get up, stretch, jump rope, do all the things. And then like, I got had some errands and stuff to do. And like I finished everything by like 11 o'clock and I just had the rest of the day to like do whatever I wanted. And I was like, I've been addicted to that ever since. I was like, man, I got everything out of the way early. I don't have to worry about anything else. And like, I was like, I'll design my life around that. That's how I did. Do you do index funds or mutual funds? I haven't yet just because I haven't educated myself enough on it. I didn't want to, I don't like to be one of those people to be like, just hop in it because the trendy thing like i actually want to take uh ah uh, never mind i can't even share it now because i'll I have to quit this call all right but nonetheless i just tell you what's on here so youtube i got some meditations manifest miracles release negative energy i got some jordan highlights <laughs> i got big sean on releasing negative energy um Derek grace how how we made 11 million in the pandemic Kobe Bryant, outwork everyone. Um, so it's just like you're you're literally your YouTube will tell you everything that you you were into. So it's like if you if if you don't like if you think social media is negative, you may have to do a, a audit of like what you're letting into your brain. So or what information you're digesting. So I realized too another good book, uh, the power of the sub subconscious mind. Okay. Um, I realize how much information that's just dumped on us that we don't even realize that it gets affecting the way we go about our our uh, our lives or it has an effect on you. And that was a big thing for me too. I really got really purposeful about what I let into my brain, conversations I have with people. Like it's, it because I just don't want people dumping trash in my brain. Like, so I can be having a conversation with a person like, oh, this person can't even 
their brain's not even at the point to comprehend what the thing I want to say next. Or not even comprehend, but just like the level to take it to where I'm going to take it. And the same with like, it changed, that book changed the way I looked at everything. Like it changed the way I watched sports. It changed the way, like I, I like I said, conversate with people. It changed who I talk to or what I talked about. Um, Cause your su subconscious mind is so powerful, man. And people just let people just dump all their negative or terrible way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And even the way you, you know, talk to yourself. So I definitely recommend that, man. That, that's a game changer right there. Um, but I realize everything's mindset for the most part. It starts in the mind. And it's like, that's what I want to, I want to control my mind. I want my son to be able to control his mind. I want, like, you know why I'm such a big Dallas Maverick fan? <laughs> if, if you had to guess, what would you think the reason I'm a big, big Dallas Maverick fan? Because all right, uh, even better question, all. how long have you remembered me being a Dallas Maverick fan? Like, Dude, that might have been the first thing you ever told. We was probably, what, 13, 12? That might have been the first thing out your mouth to me. Is you're a Mavericks fan arguing with AJ about the Lakers. That probably is the first thing you ever told me, honestly. <laughs> I became a Dodge Matter fan in sixth grade. I was using, uh, I was playing NBA 2K on Dreamcast. Damn. And I used uh, Steve Nash. It was when I had Steve Nash, Michael Finley, Dirk, LaFrance, uh, I think maybe I had Jameson too. Um, I would kill with Steve Nash. I would have like 25 points, 25 assists, something stupid numbers, like just ridiculous. And it it formulated me into being this huge fan. Cause like middle school is when you start making your own decisions. Yeah. And like, I remember I, I, <laughs> I was playing a game. I was doing like a replay or something. And I was like, just looking at the logo. Cause I never knew, I didn't know what a fucking Maverick was. Like I didn't know it was a horse. Like, I just know that the Dallas Maverick. So I'm looking on the logo and I'm like, oh shit, that's a horse in the basketball. Like I never knew what it was until I just like looked closely one day playing the video game. And so the fact that I used to kill with Steve Nash, finding that out, and then I started learning, like I learned who Mark Cuban was and just how different he was from all the other owners. And like, <laughs> it just formulated to me being this huge fan. It was like, yeah, why is the first decision I made on my own with no outside influence. Like, I didn't like this team because I'm from there. I didn't like this team because my parents like this team. Like, this was my decision that I am a Dallas Maverick fan. And that's like, and that's never going to, I mean, this is, I, got, I, got, I may live in Ohio, but on game day, my heart belongs to Dallas. Like, that's- why I'm a Pacers fan as well. I was like, this is my team. I'm not from here, but I just enjoy it, man. That's and not that's, and that's what I liked about you, too. I, and I, I felt that. Like, I knew how you were, like, because I was a big, you know, Reggie Miller was still one of my favorite players, too. But mm -hmm. you say, I knew there was no, in school, there was no other Dallas Maverick fans. And I knew there were no, there were no other Indiana <coughs> Pacers fans. Everybody, I like the top team. I like the, I like the Lakers. I like the Spurs. I like the Pistons. Or, like, I knew, I was like, yo, Xavier likes the Pacers. Nobody else likes the Pacers. You, Jermaine O'Neal, you just, that was your squad, Stephen Jack. Like, mm -hmm. I'm like, and that's what, like, even drew me to you. It was like, yo, he a real one because don't nobody else like them but him. Mm -hmm. And so that's, yeah, man. But that's why I'm a Dallas Maverick fan. And, like, I'm not budging on that. Like, that's just how it is, man. But it's like, that was the first idea or, like, decision I made with no outside influence that I can remember, at least. So, yeah, man. It's a, but you got you to gotta teach people how to make think for themselves or people got to find out how to think for themselves. But if they go read a book, they go watch a video, like people are out there giving the play, they're giving the formulas, but it's like people not listening to it. So like I said, a lot of people I follow on social media is either like entrepreneurs or this and that. A lot of black ones too. So it, it, it some I feel like a lot of people I follow, everybody should know these people. You know what I mean? Like every black person should know these people. And I'm like, our people are so caught up and they're waiting for LeBron or a Jay-Z to give them the play and not saying Jay-Z and LeBron don't give, they do, they do give the information, but the, the place they're looking for that information isn't where it's like going to the grocery store, looking for hardware tools. Right. You know I mean? <laughs> like not, Le, people are looking for like LeBron to give them some prof profound thought and stuff after a fucking 48 minute game. But like, Go watch the Need in the Dough podcast that he got with Maverick Carter if you want to learn about financial literacy. 
Go listen to Jay Z's interview when he's with Warren Buffett. If you want to learn some game, that was a powerful interview. That you know was a powerful interview. People waiting to, for them to give some profound statement after awards that's going to change. But like, no, that's not how it works. You're not going to you're not going to the place where they're giving that information. But there's dudes every day that's not as famous as them. Prize, I ain't gonna say as much money as them because them cats is paid. But they're very successful black people, tons of millionaires that are giving the game on an everyday basis. And I was like, well, I'll be one of those people. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, man, it's, it's, I, but I, in my, in my eyes and the people I see, I think there's a big shift going on in back, black culture of like financial literacy and just, you know, what to do, investing in stocks, things like that, man. They're really trying to, the, I think the internet leveled the playing field pretty, uh, you know, drastically. So, and my, my, like, at the end of the day, and it's so simple. Like at the end of the day, all I'm doing is writing books and having conversations. And I can just say, hey, if you guys want to go buy my book, go to wealthydelivery.com. And like, I do that once a video. That video is going to be on the internet forever. There's going to be tons and tons of people coming to see this video, or maybe not right out the gate, but two years, three years from now, now you got these income streams that are just snowballing. Mm-hmm. And that's how it works, man. It's like, but I'm not gonna get that, my guy. You're gonna wait for the next 50 cent raise. You're gonna net like. It's true. I, I I had a big life changing moment. I wrote about it in this book actually. I I remember it snowed. I had to work. I used to work overtime like crazy, like. And I thought that was the only way you can get extra money, like. So I work Monday. I normally work Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and every occasion I pick up like a Friday or a Saturday. And I remember this one night, I had picked up overtime for Friday. And, I mean, it was supposed to snow like crazy that night. And I usually got up around like 5 p.m., had to work about 6. I worked 7 to 7. And it didn't start snowing crazy until about 8. And, like, I just knew for sure, like, our the you usually get, like, a text from our manager, like, hey, you know, we cancel patients tonight or we're this and that, blah, blah, blah stay home or whatever so i knew i looked at the schedule before i went home that night or that day and there was only one patient on the schedule we normally like watch two patients at a time there was one patient on the schedule i'm like oh they probably canceled this person it's supposed to snow like crazy woke up no text message i was like okay i guess i clearly got to work today and <laughs> it was me and another co-worker that was at a different lab because we have several different labs at like around columbus and it's she was at another lab and I was at my lab. You know, I'm working solo. And the one patient came in. I thought the dude was crazy for one. I was like, dude, you know, supposed to snow like crazy. You coming in? Like, I figured, like, all right, maybe he won't show up. I'll just go home, call it a night. He showed up. He was like a foreigner, too. So that's probably why he probably didn't look at the, that's probably racist to say, but who cares? This is my podcast. I say what I want. Um, <laughs> but no, that's I'm like, I was like, uh, it started snowing about eight o'clock and it started like coming down like crazy. And I'm like pissed now because I'm like, yo, it's it's snowing, snowing. Like trucks and stuff are already out. <laughs> and by the end of the night, it ended up being like a level three snow emergency. Oops. Like, cause I'm me and my tech our coworker are texting each other, like, yo, this is some bullshit. Like they should have canceled patients tonight. And I was like, I'm not staying here, like I gotta get home. <laughs> like, you know, like, I'm not about this, you know, so it usually take me about 15 to 20 minutes to get to work. It took me like two hours to get home <laughs> that morning. And I was hot, Xavier, like I was hot. And it made me, and, it, and listen, I was making $25 an hour, which is pretty good money. Like mm-hmm. what, I, what I thought was good money until I started studying, you know, financial freedom. But I'm like, I just sacrificed my life for, a three hundred dollar, three hundred dollar paycheck. Meanwhile, this company, they probably get like thousands of dollars for that sleep study. You know what I mean? Yeah, they got their overhead and got this, but that ain't my issue. Like, and which is fine. That's their system because I'm a part. I'm a cog in their system. Mm-hmm. But it's still like it made me think. Like, all right, if I died that night or I died driving home, is this company gonna take care of my son? Are they gonna do? No, they're gonna send them some. We're gonna send my family some generic ass flowers, put your in thought and some prayers, and then hire the next person to come fucking fill in my spot. And that's what like it put up like, yo, I'm never 
working for and like I'm never giving more time to a company than I'm going to give to myself. And I was like, I'll build my own shit. And that really pushed, that really set me off. And it wasn't even that that happened that really set me off. It was the fact that not one single manager text to see if we made it home okay. You know what I mean? Like, and that's, that were really, I was like, is this the kind of company I want to work for? Like, is this, because if I ran a company and while I knew one of my employees was out, we wasn't a very big company, but I just like, I realized how much this company didn't care about us. And it, and when I first started working there, it was a great company, very camaraderie like a family. But as time went on, things kind of changed. And, but yeah, I was like, I would have, a text, nobody could, I could have just been on the side of the fucking road. And it just like, that really just rubbed me the wrong way. I'm like, yo, I'm just, I'm not just about to be a number and just working for trading time for money for some company to make them rich or make them wealthy while they're sitting warm under the fucking fire. And I'm out here in a level three snow emergency. So yeah, I mean, that really just, that set me off, man. And I was like, I'm not, I don't care if I, like, I don't care how long it takes me, how long it's going to take. Like, I'm going to build my own shit and live off that. And that's it, man. And, but it's like, you're so hard on yourself, man, when you have real goals. And, but sometimes you really have to take a look back and like, look where you are, man. I've done a lot of shit in the last three years. Like, I, I remember I first wrote the first book. I didn't even look at myself as, a, as an author. I was just, oh, wow. I was, like, I was just, cause I didn't write it for that. I was like, I just want this, these knowledge to go to my son just in case something happened to me. But I still didn't even register myself as an author until people like started reading and giving me feedback. Like, yo, this is fire, bro. You, I'm like, well, thanks. So I was just writing, but then I really clicked like, oh shit, I'm an author. I can write more. I can do this. I can do coaching. So it's just so much. I'm like, yo, I just can't go to work and be happy and go home and whatever. It's just, I couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> if you can have a dream project, like you had all the resources, access to all the people you needed, and no, like you was like, hey, Xavier, we're giving you the green light. Anything you need, we're gonna make this project happen. What would it be? Oh, that's easy, man. Mental illness. I would build a big, huge build. I mean, I don't know, ten story building. And I put it in the middle of Columbus, Ohio. And I would just get all the doctors, the place you can live, and I would just start there, man. Because mental health, like you said earlier, is huge, man. And especially in our demographics, and we really need to push mental health severely. So if I had unlimited sources, easily mental health, easily. That's dope, man. Yeah, uh, I feel you on that, man. That's that's real shit. Um, yeah, man. That's why I push, I push meditation hard, man. Like. And I think about like what did our ancestors do? Like our ancestors had to meditate like crazy. And once you find that method that actually works, the people have to realize meditation is just like anything else. It's a is a habit, like a skill. You, you got to build it. And like you're not going to nail it every time you go and do it. Like people think med they can't sit and just meditate. But I started doing uh Wim Hof. You ever heard of that? Mm -mm. And this dude's like, he's like it's the Iceman or something. His, his nickname, his name is Wim Hof. But this dude, would like, he does his breathing technique. And then he can go, like, be in, like, these fucking ice baths or these cold-ass waters for, like, long-ass time. Like, just because he's his, his mental capacity is just nuts. And, uh, oh, wow. yeah, you should check him out. Um, but I started using that, and that was, like, the first time I've ever really, like, felt it. I was like, oh, shit, I'm fucking meditating. And I've like been addicted to that ever since. Like I just, so some days I do it for five, some days I do it for like 20, but, or sometimes I even do it just like at a quick, I take like a quick fucking hit. I'll do like 10 big breaths and then just like hold for a minute. Cause like, what do you do? He does like these big breaths. And then on the exhale, he holds like with no, like nothing in the lungs. It's like no air, no nothing. And you hold, you do for like one to two minutes and you know, you just get into this, you're, you'll feel it or your body, you're kind of, I don't know, man. It's, it's, the way I look at meditation is, and why breathing is so important. Like there's two things you do consciously and unconsciously. That's breathe and think. So if you can control the way you breathe, you can control the way you think. So that's how I looked at meditation. That's like, it's controlled breathing. And it's weird. Like I'll even try, like when I do it, I'm like, oh, I want to think about this. Now I want to think about this. Like in my head, I'm like, oh, now I want to think about. Like I literally get to choose what I want to think about, and that's a great way to just change 
your state of being like i want to be happy right now or i want to you i want to think about a happy moment and it's like it seems like the right thing just come to your head man so it was very powerful for me man and that's <laughs> i remember my cousin jarell um when i first did it i was like yo because he's like you know he's still he's still my right hand man without <laughs> doubt <laughs> but i was like yo i just did this meditation you need to check it out and he was like on it like that and he does it too but and i like i, I teach my kids like yo i'm like deep breaths deep breaths like and just it's these little habits man life is built off habit uh, and that's really agree with that. you know and I it doesn't take long to build a habit you know what i'm saying i agree with that so um yeah man I, I, mental health, man. That's especially we need it. We need it. <laughs> we need it bad. I think that's uh, very important. <laughs> if you could have dinner with any four people, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Four people. I would definitely have to say, honestly, David Goggins be one after reading his book. Um, Fred Hampton. And not because the movie when I already knew about him before. And let me say that because people listen to people out there. Way before this movie came out, uh, Malcolm X and Megger Evers. Megger Evers just because how he dealt with racism and he even knew it was going to kill him. Now he still, it's kind of like you said, that mental strength he had that he still moved forward a lot of things. So why, honestly, all four of them just because they're really mentally strong but a lot of people would have broke. Yeah. So I would definitely want to learn how they did that. Yeah. Malcolm X is like, every time I ask somebody, like Malcolm X has probably been on like 98% of the people I've asked for this show. So my, yeah, it's, yeah. It's a, and I guarantee if like you sat down and talked to these dudes, like what made them like mentally like that, I guarantee it'll be some kind of tactic of like, some kind of habit of like a mental, you know, some kind of meditation, some kind of structure to how they go about doing it, man. Cause that, that was some heavy shit they were dealing with. Like mm -hmm. Fred Hampton, man, was just so young, man. Like mm -hmm. that, be that kind of leader at that age, and it's it's crazy, man. But it just shows you how America looks at us, man. Like here we it's are, here we are, thirty-two. What's Fred Hampton like? What twenty? Twenty-one. Twenty-one. Like, like, come on, man. Like leading a revolution like that. Come on, man. That's that's crazy. I wouldn't even imagine doing something like that at twenty-one. <laughs> Listen to you. <laughs> um, superpower, man. I feel like every human being has a superpower. What do you think your superpower is? That's a good question. Um, being understanding, if that makes any sense. I think I'm able to... If someone speaks to me, I feel like they can be like, all right, he doesn't just think I'm full of shit. Like, he actually is trying to see where I'm coming from. Because for a lot of people, if you sit down and try to understand them, that goes a long way. Yeah, I agree. So. Really. That's, I think that's, you should definitely read The Power of the, I'm sorry, or the, power of the Subconscious Mind. Because I think you, that's kind of like, because I feel like I kind of have that too. Because like, I don't, I don't believe there's a right or wrong, like in a sense. Like, hey, if you look at it that way, that's how you look at it. Like, that's, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna be like, oh, that's, that's, I think so much in the world we're like, oh, that's the wrong way. Or that's, but hey, what you, eat, what you eat don't make me shit. So I'm not gonna <laughs> knock what you think. That's, if that's what you think. Because I know I think, I'm gonna think what I think. And I don't want Correct. you trying to like talk my shit about my stuff. So no, nah, but yeah, sitting around to understand the stand, like the rebuttal is definitely huge. Um, speaking of a real superpower if you had a real superpower like a superhero power which one would you pick and why how would you use it uh, it's funny it would be Professor Xavier because it would be his <laughs> ability to uh, what's it to know what people's thinking yeah and I only pick that just because like you know once again people might be wanting to hurt themselves have doubt like if you knew your, your friend was doubting himself you knew he had a great idea you could leave like bro I know you're doubting in your head. Let's go ahead and do this. Yeah. Yeah. So that was and, huge. Uh, and I think even you saying it that way for like how you would use it is important because like a lot of people use that shit for bad. I realize too, skill has no, there's no such thing as good or a bad skill. Like you can take two superheroes, you take a superhero, you can take a villain. Mm -hmm. they, they can have the same superpower or they can have the same skill set 
they probably learn from the same teacher. One just use it for bad, one use it for good. And like you using, you, uh, you know, being able to know what people think to like push people forward and like believe in themselves is just versus like somebody wants to know what people think so they can scam them. You know what I'm saying? Like that just goes to, you know, goes to your personality, man. I, I commend that. Um, mine's, I, dude, when I saw Doctor Strange, and <laughs> yeah, Batman's my see. I don't need. I don't. I'm not a big superpower guy because Batman's my favorite superhero. But mm -hmm. that's a whole another story and like in mindset and mental and like just going about life a certain way. But over the I, Punisher, huh? Over the Punisher. Oh yeah. Well, that listen. It, me and Batman got along. It, it, that's a whole nother <laughs> conversation. Well, we that's because <laughs> we're nerd out for a long time right now. Well, I'm not gonna do that right now. But when I saw Doctor Strange. And you remember that part where he was like sleeping, but he was like reading the, the book. Mm -hmm. Yo, I thought that was so fire. Like, <laughs> I thought, I like, if I could do that and just wake up and start implementing, like, that's, that saved me so much time. So That'd be a game changer. Yeah. So I, I, I've been in love with that ever since I've seen that, man. Um, Maybe we can wrap this up, man. I, got, I do got one more question for you, man. I cannot, I would never forgive myself if I didn't ask this question. Did you go to Lenscrafters today? <laughs> you know what's funny, man? Back in the day, you know me, Lenscrafters, man, I didn't save myself no help back in the day. I got to give you that, no help. <laughs> Yo! I remember when Sam would say that, I would laugh every time like it was a new joke. Like that, I in, I know we haven't seen each other and spoken like 10 some years, but I probably think about that joke at least <laughs> once a year and laugh. Like I, I, got, I got a group chat with, me with some friends. And my one friend's always throwing this pizza roll joke at one of our other friends. And like, it, and it's so off, like, my, this dude doesn't even like pizza rolls like that, right? It, but it just, it's such a long lasting joke that I just laugh every single time, anytime he could slide it in. And that's how I felt like what Sam would say the lens crafter joke. Like, dude, I love, like, I still think about that and laugh to this day. I had to, but I had to ask it, man. I had to ask. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, oh, man. But nah, man, this was dope, man. I, pre I appreciate you coming to rock with me, man. Um, we gotta stay in touch, man, for sure, man. And you, like I said, I mean, man, you're doing great things, man. Like I honestly, what's crazy, what you're doing now, if you told me 10, 15, hello and go when you were in middle school, I can see it. You've always been not I'm not saying it's your process. You remember when they listen to this. I'm not just saying it's like he really always has been next level. Honestly, even when we were kids. So just to see it going that way is impressive. I, I appreciate that, man. That puts a little something right here, man. But because I think I'm at a point where I know I have to go fully into it. You know what I mean? And there's a there's a little bit of there's a little fear. I, I've definitely did a great job. I think myself just getting over fear. I don't fear much these days, especially after I become a dad. Like I I don't fear shit for the most part. Um, but knowing I like all right, this is what I'm supposed to be. I ha I know too much information not to be more vocal about the things I know or like trying to do what I'm doing. So I appreciate that, man. It's just it's that that helps me push forward and to keep doing this, man. And uh, yeah, man, I just appreciate it, man. That's you're giving me a, a, a shot of confidence, man. <laughs> but yeah, man, I like I said, man. You, if anytime you want to come up here, anytime you just want to come back on here, and I'm sure we can, there's plenty of stuff we can talk about just just because we have who we are, man. But like I said, man, you always been one of my favorite cats, man. So I like I just I was sitting, I was like, man, who's some dope people? I just love to have a great conversation with. And like you popped in my head, I was like, "Yo, Xavier's always been that dude." So yeah, man, man. shoot, it's been all it's always all love and same thing. We've had, like I said, hundreds of thousands of conversations. We are always respectful, always love. We always had a good time. So I hundred percent agree with you. Yeah, man, for sure, man. Well, hey, I appreciate, it, man. I'm gonna let you get back to your day. I'm about to go ahead and get this rope in. You know, I gotta. I'm still trying to get them buckets. I. I got I'm trying to get another one of these bad boys. You know what I'm saying? This, oh snap! You know what I'm saying? You ain't joking. <laughs> uh, now we, I want the big one. See, this is, I want the like the big tall Johns. That's what we're trying to get. This is like okay. so the league trophies, and then there's like they have the best teams from the, each league that plays in a big tournament. Gotcha. Now we haven't won that one yet. We've been close, 
but I want that. I need it. I like I that will fulfill my life if we did that. So I got one of my teammates. We usually go get some workouts in. He just had surgery though, so he's kind of like in rehab. But he he just got to clear to like he's like I got cleared to shoot around stuff. So with the weather breaking, we're probably gonna start working out again and like getting shots up and get our games right. But I mean, I, and that's the thing, I man. I think if I like try to play basketball like professionally, I don't think I would have enjoyed it. But like doing it on my own time, like. And when mm -hmm. I like to do it, it, just makes me love the game that much more. But uh, yeah, man, I'm I'm coming for it, man. So y'all gonna get it, knowing you. Y'all gonna get it. <laughs> but hey, man, X, like I said, man, all love. Um, hit me up whenever, man. I'll hit you up anything, man. Like I said, man, I just you're like I said, respect, man, all across the board, man. Since since day one. So, but uh, I'll let you go, man, and uh, I appreciate you, dog. Man, thank you for having me on, man. Like, seriously, it's always love, and I really enjoy speaking to you, man. I really did. <laughs> All right, bro, man. I like it at you, man. You take it easy, man. All right, you too, man. All Bye. Right.